<laughs> getting that updated. Just like home. <laughs> yep, just like home. Um, any of you do like me, I set one about 10 minutes early, and one's about two minutes behind. So, uh, Welcome to our presentation of Civil Rights Movement in the South. We have Strider Arkansas Benston presenting for us today. Strider is going to share some freedom songs, poetry, and his own role in the Civil Rights Movement which will include his struggle and some open discussion. Strider led the inner internal Strider led the internal security force for the march on Montgomery and later became a later a labor organizer in Chicago. Both in Teamsters and National Mail Handlers Unions, Strider earned a degree in political science and his Master's of Humanities in Philosophy and History from the University of the, from UC Denver in 1998. We're excited for Strider to share today and look forward to the presentation. Appreciate y'all being here and take it away, Strider. Hey, hey, thank you. Oh uh, gotta do my addiction soon. <laughs> Hopefully I won't have to do that too many times. Um, just whatever I could find last night and this morning, some of the things I brought. And normally I would give stuff away, but I never know if it's my last copy of something. So if I get to do something again, I'll be better organized, but things have been rough. Um, so um, that's kind of what's here. Um, let me, uh, all right, uh, part of this is how or why it did a southern boy of pale skin and pale parents grow up, get woke, uh, to become a non-racist and anti-racist and to tread the long and crooked trail up and down and sideways through swamps under rivers over mountains from the uh, baseball and football fields of Malvern and the track and trees in Arkansas to the docks of Chicago and the cloisters of Cambridge, the jails of Alabama and the councils of Longmont for uh, to be right here in the old folks hall right now after Juneteenth. Does any of this matter? Y'all can decide. I can only try to tell you some truth as I have seen and heard and felt and done it these past 80 years. I thank y'all for coming here, maybe to listen or challenge or question or care. <clears throat> some of you know I got run over by a truck two days after Thanksgiving and destroyed my e-bike, but somehow I missed my head and my feet, which he was aiming at. It was fortunately it was a big truck rather than uh, one that would crunch you. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> he was born in Alabama. He was a bred in Illinois. He was a Nothing but a plain black boy. Swing low, swing low, sweet, sweet cherry on. Nothing but a plain black boy. Drive him past the pool hall, drive him past the show. Blind within his casket, yeah, but maybe he'll know. Down on 47th Street and underneath the hill, the northwest corner prairie that he loved so well. Swing low, swing low, sweet cherry hut. Well, don't forget the dance halls, the Warwick and Savoy, where he picked his women and he drank his liquid joy. Oh, down born in Alabama, nothing but a plain black boy. Y'all know who wrote that? Gwendolyn Brooks. 
She was the poet laureate of Illinois for 40 years. She came down to Little Rock and wrote uh, some of uh, her, her stuff there. Little Rock uh, up the road from where I grew up. Oscar Brown Jr. wrote the music to it and sang it. And she was speaking at St. Cadgerton's in Denver. She was 86 years old. She spoke for more than an hour and then she signed books for more than an hour and I was about the last person and I sang it to her and she loved it. And she, she wrote the words, but Oscar Brown Jr. wrote the, the music. Donnie L. Bett, some of you might know him, he was with KG and you for a while. He wrote a book and did a movie about Oscar Brown Jr., which would include that. But anyway, uh, uh, so she had the strongest handshake of anyone I shook hands with that year. She was 86 years old and she died about six months later. Um, so learning is not a linear thing. It's not a linear thing. So y'all just open up that dark shade and let the sun shine in, let the sun shine in. Now truth has lots of ways of lurking around the door. Truth has some hard sayings that must be said and I, uh, before they can get in the door. I've been trying for the last 60 years or so to find a language to interpret them into so as y'all can hear. Because just now our whole dang country and our whole blessed world right now seems to be jumping off a cliff. Aiming at Dante's Inferno or Hitler's Hell or Stalin's Stiflement or Jesus' Cross or Spartacus's Cross. Or maybe we can reach the other side for decency and dialogue to build a great new world of community and compassion, of justice and truth and beauty and love. Now Socrates, they had him drink hemlock. What was his crime? For teaching people not what to think, but how to think. And that's what we're dealing with in this country right now. Now, they tell us everything's just fine. Beautiful day, ain't it? No wars, no forest fires, no floods, no killing, no homeless, no hunger, no hatred, no rage, no raping, no rapacity, no mendacity, no slavery, no star, no starvation, no stifling, no Sam Cook saying, it's been a long, long time coming, brother, but I know change gonna come. Oh, yes, it is. Now, we didn't sing that much, but that was the theme song of the Civil Rights Movement, but Sam Cook got killed right before the year started. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, I have no idea who the plain black boy born in Alabama and in Illinois was, so who is this person? No, no, Gwendolyn Brooks wrote the song. About who? It wasn't necessarily about an, a single person. Oh, it was okay. it was the I concept. Was the, the concept. Got it. And and uh, thank bringing it up. I worked on Forty Seventh Street in Chicago, and three fifteen in the morning every night, I would get a ride with three or four black guys who were going to the far south side, and they drive me all across Forty Seventh Street and let me out on State Street. So I walked two or three blocks to the L train at 3.30 in the morning every day for a couple of years. So I knew 47th Street real well. That was my street. That's kind of why the song really resonates in me. 39th Street, no, no, I better not go down there. 43rd Street, no, 47th, that was my street. 
So, uh, uh, and the Lord said, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, send me. Um, and, um, um, but I'm a man of unclean lips. And the Lord said, here, suck on this hot coal and then get woke and get out there and speak some truth. And like in SDF, they said, if you don't know, learn. If you know, teach. And that's kind of what we're dealing with. Um, what was the 60s? Well, it started in 1957 in Little Rock, where right near where I grew up. Some people say Montgomery, and that makes sense too. But the 60s died on April the 4th of 1968 when they killed Martin Luther King. And uh, so we got a different world to deal with then, uh, now. Um, so, a little about truth. Now lots of y'all, maybe most of y'all, I mean like how you tell the difference between lots and most? It's just numbers. That's what we was talking about, numbers, I mean. Now, lots of y'all think numbers equals truth. Now, honey child, numbers ain't truth. Might be about truth. That's easy, like six. Now, six true? That's crazy. Six ain't true. It's just six. That's all. Now, if I say six is a half dozen peoples, well, that's true, but it ain't true. It don't say nothing. Now what if I say six is one more finger than folks got on one day hand? Well, Judge Charles Stevenson, he only got three and a half. Three and a half plus one don't make six. So it ain't right. And what ain't right is wrong. Um, stone cold wrong. Now what if I tell you speed of light is 186,272 miles per second? That's a whole bunch. How y'all know that? Did you go out with a ruler and measure it? No, somebody done told you. Like, uh, somebody done told you, like about Jesus or Lincoln or Hitler or Rome or how long Cairo done been there or Mars or how big is the sky? It's like numbers, but numbers ain't true, even if they be true. Numbers ain't what's happening. They don't do nothing, nothing. They just be. Now, nothing don't do nothing can't be truth. Might be true. Black on ink might be true, but it ain't truth. Might be red, might be blue, might be hot, might be dry, might be yesterday. Still, it ain't true. Truth is what's happening. Everything that's happening. Now, if I'll just names it, like yesterday or Los Angeles or Sadie or Memphis or blue skies up above, might be true as heck. But it ain't truth. Truth got to do something. Got to mean something. It's always changing. It's always new. Like fire. Heraclitus done said that 2,600 years ago. Dude was on to something. Said fire is truth. Well, it's pretty darn close. Truth means alive. Just like a baby. Truth ain't dead. Can't never be dead. It's breathing, growing, changing. Now yesterday's truth, be true yesterday. And here no more. Don't be so today, ain't gonna be tomorrow, ever. But it done left traces. Always leave traces. That's why we study history. His story, her story. Always leave traces. Fanny Lou Hamer, she done taught me that. She done left traces in me. And now I'll pass them on to y'all. The modern world don't take no poetry. Thinks numbers is truth. Gotta kill poetry, shoot it, miss it. Y'all know what's happening next. Like Jesus hung him on a cross. Jesus, a poet, maybe the best all time ever was. String him up, watch him bleed, die. Poets too, real poets, they bleed. What they bleed? It bleeds truth. It pours out their heart, their eyes, their hands, their sex, their shoulders, their feet, their soul. 
He pours out truth so that you don't die from having none. Well, got to leave y'all now. Got to go dig dirt trying to stay alive so that I can sing you a little more truth. That's all. I'm going to stay a while longer. I left that a long time ago. Um, now, uh, I was born in Tennessee, raised up in Arkansas, and struggled in Alabama. I done some loving and some crying, came mighty close to dying, because I never didn't give a damn. Found some peace in Tuscaloosa, love in New York City, and a family back in Philly, PA. But my restless mind kept wandering, kept driving ever onward, so I couldn't spare the time to stay. Well, I've been weak and I've been lazy, and I've let my people down. There's been times I couldn't see beyond myself. So I walked that lonesome highway through another lonely town, never knowing how to scream and cry for help. We've wasted all of our lives in a wish that we'd be happy, trying to run from all the heartaches and the fears. Can't seem to find a time to listen for the pure and simple message. The answer is blowing in the wind. I may have missed up a few verses, but um, the Odyssey. Um, done some traveling, mostly on my thumb. A guy named Homer did that too. But what could he see or know? He was blind. Maybe he got woke. Well, I sort of got woke back in 1949. My mother took me down to the courthouse one day, and it's a hot day, and I look over and I see there's a big water fountain there, big one making noise, and a little one down my size, little spigot, and the big one said white, and the little one said colored. Well, I figured, uh, colored water, what color? Maybe it's blue. You know, so I went up to get some colored water, and bam, my mother knocked me down. Uh, um, and uh, I learned, no, no, you can't, you can't find out about blue water. Uh, ain't for you, can't drink no blue water. Now, um, uh, maids got about two and a half dollars a week at that time for full-time employment. That was, uh, and one, one day, uh, the mother or grandmother of the lady at our house came over and brought her grandson. And I was five and I was a good speller, I was a good reader. And she's showing off her little grandson. He's littler than me and younger, he's about four. And she said, spell the books of the Bible. You know, Genesis, Exodus, you know, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. I mean, I couldn't spell no Deuteronomy, and I was a good speller. So that, I mean, real life, um, no one ever since that moment has been able to tell me that black people do not have equivalent intelligence of any other group in the world. And that is, uh, that's how they do that kind of stuff. They, they lock it into you. And then um, um, Little League Baseball. My dad helped get started the Little League Baseball team in my hometown. Where's the black kids? Now, I knew they couldn't be in, our, in, in the same school, but they had a school. Well, they didn't, where's the black kids? I mean, I was a good baseball player. I wasn't afraid of the competition, but, um, that, uh, that kind of stuff took place everywhere. Um, then came South Pacific. You've got to be carefully taught before you are six or seven or eight to hate all the people your relatives hate and people whose eyes are a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. So uh, then came Little Rock. 1957, right up the road from where I grew up. 
and they're sticking bayonets in little girls to prevent them from going to school. It's like, I got woke, you know, and now it's a crime to get woke. So um, here, here's what we're dealing with. And um, uh, they could never put me back to sleep once you get really woke. Uh, later on, Dr. Martin Luther King said, the worst thing you can do is to sleep through a revolution. And uh, that's, that's going on. Um, Martin, after he left Atlanta and went to Crozer Seminary, he met Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman taught him about Gandhi. Howard and his wife had visited with Gandhi in 1935 and again later on. And so Martin broadened his education and uh, really poured his life into it. So um, um, about the, uh, the movement, Macomb, Mississippi was about where it started. And Herbert Lee was the one who invited Bob Moses down to organize uh, uh, the town and try to get the right to vote. And Herbert Lee's next door neighbor, they'd grown up together as kids. He was a state representative, white of course. And one day he just comes up uh, in, the, in the trucking yard and pulls out a gun and blows Herbert Lee to death. You know. And one guy who witnessed that, Lewis Allen, he knew he had to read the state, came back a year or two later, was gonna testify, and he got killed for, for just almost testifying. So that's what it was like in the, in the deep south. And um, uh, the, there's a movie called Freedom Song. Maybe nobody ever saw it. It was only put on like TV. It, wasn't, it didn't do the circuit. Danny Glover played the, the lead and, um, um, and with the SNCC convention, the 50 year anniversary, uh, I was in Raleigh and Danny Glover was there and Belafonte was there. And I told Danny Glover about that movie. So everything in it was great, except when they took him out of the jail at night, I said, in the movie, there's one of them and two of us. There was a kid and a freedom worker and they go out in the woods and uh, the deputy sheriff says, y'all can go now. And the freedom worker tells the kid, no, no, don't move. They're gonna kill you, you know. And so uh, I said, everything was right, except I was in that car. I know what it was like. It wasn't one of them and two of us. There was three of them and one of me. And it was two o'clock in the morning in Marengo County, Alabama. And they got me chained up to a, 300 pounder on this side and an and a ex-marine on this side and he starts poking me in the ribs with his 45 pistol. Says, you feel that, end lover? You better go for it. We're going to take you around the next curve back in the woods and we're going to pistol with you to death. Go for it, boy. And it's the only time in my life I made an absolute decision about the future. Otherwise, you want to be open. And I, I told myself, as long as the car is moving, I'm going to put up with anything they do to me. If the, cop, if the car stops, I'm going to try to kill them all because I know I'm dead if the car stops. Turned out they were bluffing and they took me down to jail in Lyndon, Alabama. And I was, uh, uh, I, I don't know where the, oh, here. The, uh, that was the county seat because uh, in Alabama, well, I'd been in jail for a week because uh, I, I, was, I was singing at a demonstration in another uh, county, Camden, Alabama, they tried to kill me because I was singing. And they didn't kill me because the TV was there, Humley Brinkley News. And so uh, uh, there, I got pictures of that, but I, 
Uh, anyway, in um, uh, get down to Linden, and um, uh, Jimmy Collier, the folk singer, you see him, this is Jimmy here, uh, on Freedom Song, Selma, Alabama. That's me there with the town, this is Jimmy. Pete Seeger's wife took that photo, Tashi Seeger. And uh, Jimmy was so mature, I thought he was three or four years older than me. But he had left home at 15 and from Fort Smith, Arkansas, moved up to Chicago with his grandfather, joined the Air Force at age 15. So he'd already done his time and been out before the Vietnam War got going. And he was a folk singer and uh, he was my best friend in the movement, but we never had more than two or three days to actually talk because so much was happening. And he got me out of jail at midnight on my 21st birthday in Marengo County. And then we go into Selma and I had to walk to the Freedom House cause Jim Clark had machine guns on top of the courthouse and they were 300 man water posse. They were gonna do a massacre that night. That was the day they murdered Jonathan Daniels in Lowndes County, the minister. Um, and I didn't know anything. I've been in jail for several weeks and I didn't know if the Voting Rights Act had passed. I didn't know about the Watts riots. I didn't know anything. Uh, so anyway, Jimmy got me out of jail and I came up and uh, uh, came up to the Freedom House. Two o'clock in the morning, I knock on the door and three rifles and a shotgun pointed out at me, who's there? And I said, Arkansas. All the guns cocked because they had a whole new crew from the north end. They didn't know me and I didn't know them. Here's a white boy doing three o'clock in the morning at, uh, at the Freedom House. You know? And there'd been night riders coming through and shooting and they were shooting back. So anyway, finally, somebody says, bring him back. So we go through the, the hallway, pitch black dark, black people sleeping on the floor. And, I don't want one of the guns to go off. We get back to the back. Silas Norman was the project director for Alabama SNCC at the time. And Leonard comes on, he said, oh, Arkansas, he says, put the guns down. We got a brother here. And we talked for a couple of minutes. And then he said, you know, if I hadn't have been here, that would have killed you. I said, I know, you know, so, uh, Real life intrudes while you're planning other things. There's just so much uh, to deal with. Uh, Bernard Lafayette, Dr. Bernard Lafayette, went down to Selma in 1962. SNCC was setting up projects in uh, four states, South uh, Arkansas with Bill Hansen, uh, Mississippi with Bob Moses, Southwest Georgia with Charles Sherrod, and they got Alabama. And they got a big X on Selma. And they said, uh, they asked us to come to Selma, but can't go there. White folks too mean and black folks too scared. And Bernard takes the X and he turns it to a plus. He said, I'm gonna go to Selma and we're gonna put Selma, Alabama on the map of the world. And that's exactly what happened. And they started organizing at the beginning of 63. Betty Mae Fikes, who used to sing with Jimmy Collier, she started the children's choir in Selma and, um, and uh, got it going. She's a great singer. Oh, thing just came to me. One time when Stokely Carmichael was dying and he'd gone to Cuba to get help, but it was too late. And um, he was in his uh, hospital room Betty Fikes comes in. She was a high schooler back in 63. And she comes in and starts, oh, Betty, the most beautiful voice I've ever heard. And Betty says, stop it. You run a game on me. Said, you were married to Miriam Makiba. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> uh, but Betty had a distinctive type of voice. And within that type of voice, 
she was absolutely wonderful. Now, she didn't have Marion McKeeba's voice. She didn't need it. But uh, Stokely might have been speaking true. And Stokely, he was, uh, uh, he's the one who brought me into the movement. Um, I had been up uh, working up in uh, Cape Cod uh, uh, 20 hours a day. I was uh, a busboy for a large restaurant and I worked uh, maintenance and clean up at night. And uh, we had a, uh, a black woman who was our chef but she had studied at the New England Conservatory of Music. She played cello, but she had phlebitis and she could never get a job because a black woman in an orchestra in America? Are you crazy? You know, she had her degree from the conservatory but could never get a real job. So she worked for the owners of Thompson's Clam Bar and did their, raise their children and was chef at the restaurant. And they had her in a rat infested, flea bitten, uh, you know, cabin as bad as the rest of us. And there was a lady there, our uh, uh, hostess, Polly Thomas, I remember, age 26. We organized a strike to demand that Gladys Lewis Seal Owens get a decent place to live. And within a half a day, they capitulated and they got her a nice cottage. And she's the one that taught me that, I mean, I knew bad stuff about Linda Johnson, but I didn't know much about Goldwater. <laughs> and she told me, look, uh, uh, Goldwater represents a whole different thing. As much as Johnson lied about Gulf of Tonkin and starting the Vietnam War, Goldwater was the you know, the head of the, uh, look at what we've got now. But anyway, uh, so, um, uh, anyway, uh, we go on and, it, well, we go back to Mississippi. Freedom Summer in 64, um, Bob Moses came up with the idea, let's bring a lot of Yankee students in and, and train them and get them down. Uh, there and the uh, they got a, a, it was 800 or so volunteers who came down uh, nobody got paid um, and uh, most they were supposed to have like $200 for, for mail or for you know sustenance or whatever and there was a wide range but a lot of them were you know, educated Yankee kids from liberal colleges. Not all, there were some Southerners and, and, and some Blacks, but mostly white. And it was incredible with Stoughton Lynn and Howard Sand and uh, uh, you know, the ed educated uh, up at uh, Oxford, Ohio. And the very first day, um, uh, Mickey Schwerner, Andy Goodman, and James Earl Cheney drive down, and they hear there's a, a church they burned down in uh, in New Shelby County, and they go out to check on that, and they get thrown in jail, and then they get let out, and then they disappear. And all the KKK is saying, all oh, they're back north partying and all this kind of stuff. But everybody in the movement knew they had killed them. And when I got out of uh, Northeast and I was coming, working my way down south, I went to try to find work at the Democratic Convention. I figured you could get a job as a waiter or something. And, but when I said waiter, they didn't understand my accent. They thought I said whiter. Like, uh, <laughs> like I was Tom Sawyer and gonna whitewash the walls. It's like, I, did, I didn't know Yankee language uh, yet. But um, so anyway, um, I uh, went out to Atlantic City and I see these uh, folks with signs up and they got the pictures of Cheney Goodman and Schwerner. They had just found the bodies at that time. And so I joined up and listened. And then Fannie Lou Hamer came down after she gave her testimony at the Credentials Committee and she told her story. And I, uh, I'd always 
done good in school and always made A's in history, but I didn't know what history was. I had no idea because I never had a teacher that was willing or competent to explain it. Listening to Fanny Lou Hamer for 10 minutes changed my life completely, and I've been part of the movement ever since. And I spent two or three days and nights dialoguing with Stokely Carmichael. And he said, come on down to Greenwood or Greenville, Mississippi and join us. And I said, well, I'm already signed up for school and I don't know anything. And so I would just be a body. Let me try to learn something and I'll be back in January. And so he kind of brushed me off. But then uh, um, uh, I, I, I studied a little bit of philosophy the only thing I could find was James Baldwin or Martin Luther King. That was the only books available in Arkansas. So I read what I could. I'm a slow reader, so I didn't read a whole lot. And um, so I uh, talked to my minister, uh, Dave Pittenger, and he was cool. He gave me a ride to the edge of town to where I could hitchhike to Alabama from Arkansas. And it was, it was, freezing rain and took me a while to get there but just because he gave me a ride to the edge of town now he was the most popular minister in Melbourne and he was sang in a barbershop quartet I mean just a totally cool guy a Presbyterian southern Presbyterian I didn't know there were two kinds um, and uh, uh, later on when they found out about me my own church tried to lynch me, and they drove Reverend Pittenger out of town. Uh, so he wound up in Texas, and uh, I met him 25 years later, and we uh, became buddies again. But, uh, that kind of stuff is kind of what goes on. Um, I'd only been in Selma maybe a week uh, when Malcolm X is coming to town. And some of my uh, friends say, hey, Arkansas, that was, my name was already Arkansas. The first day I came into town, a bunch of black kids gathered around me and said, what's your name? I said, Jim. I said, Jim, where are you from? Arkansas. Arkansas, your name Arkansas. <laughs> so here it is 60 years later, and that's still my name in the movement. So anyway, I had already been arrested the first day in town by Wilson Baker. But they, uh, my friends uh, said, let's go down to the courthouse. It'll be good experience, Judge Hare and uh, County Judge. And I said, no, no, I want to see Malcolm. He's coming in a couple hours. I said, it's all right, we'll just be there. It'll be good experience. We'll be back in plenty of time. So we go there. Hey, cool. So um, she, uh, uh, Four of us, Mike Geisen, Edward Kidd, Andy Scruggs, and me, two black and two white. And we're sitting there, and they take a recess. And I said, hey, let's go sit over there. And they said, no, Arkansas, you're crazy. And I said, what they, what they do? And we figured, well, they'll just call the bailiff, and they'll throw us out, and then we'll get to go back and see Malcolm in two hours. No, no, they didn't do that. We went over there, and Judge Hare comes in, and he looks at us and said, get your ass over there where you belong. And no, we already made a decision. They said, what are we going to do? Well, I've only been in the movement a week, so I didn't know anything. I said, I tell you what, whatever it is, let's all do the same thing. That was our entire plan. And so we just sat there. All of a sudden, he calls the bailiff, drags us up there. I convict you of contempt to court, seven days in jail and $50 fine. Chain them up and take them away. Well, the only conviction I've ever had in my life was for sitting on the white folks' side of the courtroom, which, by the way, was already illegal because the Supreme Court outlawed that in 1963, two years earlier. You cannot have segregated courtrooms. But I was convicted on that. 
45 years later, I tried to get a job as a census worker in Longmont, and no, no, you got a conviction. You can't, you can't make any money. So anyway, that was just kind of what was going on. And um, the, uh, uh, so, um, 10 days later, they, well, two weeks later, they killed Malcolm X. And we had a, uh, uh, Marion, Alabama, 30 miles away, they were having demonstrations. That's where uh, um, Coretta Scott King grew up there, and Andy Young's wife grew up there. And um, so anyway, we go up, to, I, I was gonna go, and they said, Arkansas, get out the car. We're gonna need you at Burwell Infirmary to treat the injured when they come back. So they knew it was gonna happen. C.T. Vivian, the guy with the picture with me, he was preaching that night in Marion, and they, uh, they were just gonna have a walk around the courthouse square and maybe sing James Orange was in jail at that time, and they were gonna sing to him. And um, they, uh, uh, they cut out the street lights, they smashed all the TV cameras. Richard Valeriani, NBC major reporter, got his head split open, and they came threw kids through the windows of the church. Um, uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson, his grandfather was the leader of the movement. He was 83 years old, Keitra Lee. And they go into Max Cafe and the state troopers come in and they shoot him twice in the stomach. And um, we had a vigil for Jimmy, but he died a week later. And Martin Luther King came down and gave the funeral service in Selma and then another one in Marion. And we're pouring down rain. We're marching four miles out into the country to the gravesite. And um, the um, uh, and the Sharpeville massacre had in South Africa recently occurred where they killed like 60 people on a funeral march. So we felt that might be the case here in uh, Perry County, Alabama. And um, uh, well, anyway, it was during that going out to the funeral at the gravesite, Jim Bevel came up with the idea of the March on Montgomery. And so we didn't have much time to plan that. But um, let, me, let me give you, I, I wrote a poem for Jimmy. I did not know you, Jimmy Lee, but I came to watch you lower to the earth in the highest homage, as though a king or chief or priest of sacred truth. I was one of 4,000 sad and scared and seething souls who trekked the miles from Marion in pouring rain that holy Alabama Sunday so long ago, washing away our tears replacing even our fears and anger with a determination no tide of reaction or terror could stem. Perhaps it was not my own blood upon the jacket I wore thereafter, but yours, Cheyenne's, Martin's, that of Annie Lee and Brother Rube and young St. Jonathan of Daniel. We mixed blood by, we mixed blood by day and laughter by night and tears before the dawn. The shack rocked and rang with the footsteps of our dancing. Shotgun, shoot a bullet, baby. Shotgun, shoot it right now. When a man loves a woman deep down in his soul, he'll tell the world about the good thing he's found. There have been times when I thought that I couldn't last for long. But now I think I'm able, able to, to carry on. It's been a long, long time coming, brother, but I know change gon' come. Oh, yes, it is. Yes.
with the next carload to Atlanta, perhaps never to return that terrible and wondrous winter before the dawn. I know not how many years I grew that month before the spring, but fleeting decades since, scarce have left so true a mark upon my soul. From afar they do not remember your name, those who came to carry on the torch you passed into their hands, as they do remember Rosa and Medgar and Andy and Mickey and Jim. But we who stood by your side and built our defiant anger with your ever failing breath, we who stood the cause, we know. And when we met the horses on the bridge, the gas, the whips, the clubs, the flaming eyes, and angry shouts of hatred. Yes, we knew from that moment we were certain that our cause should not have died in vain, that we would march on to Montgomery, affront the eyes of all the world, and seal one mighty victory forever along the never-ending trial trail for freedom. The struggle, the task, the prayer, the song of human dignity. And you, dear Jim Lee Jackson of Marion, Alabama, age 26, woodcutter, veteran, footnote of history, as you rose to protect your grandfather from the vicious clubs of hatred that February night, you helped to lead us on. And we, we who stood by your side, we remember. So anyway, uh, a week later, it's Bloody Sunday. We march across the bridge and go, boom, here it comes. I got knocked out twice. I was about 20 steps behind John Lewis. And the uh, second time I woke up, I was only out for like 10 or 12 seconds. And boom, you got to move. Here come the horse charge. And clubs like baseball bats hitting us with. And get back across the bridge uh, into Selma. And then, um, and Jim Clark, the sheriff, was uh, making his statement and pointing right at me. Uh, get them white ends. Uh, and we had already had dealings, so uh, he knew who I was. And um, so anyway, we get back into Brown's Chapel and the state troopers were all over, all over uh, the town. And um, we, uh, the wounded and tear gas, and John Lewis was there with us. He made a talk before they got him off to the hospital. And about 10 o'clock at night, there was crying and moaning and tear gas everywhere. And, and Cheyenne Webb, who was eight years old, she wrote a book about it called Selma, or Selma, she's a good friend of mine. Um, she said all of a sudden, the, the, the moaning turned into a hum. Ain't gonna let no tear gas turn me around, turn me around. Turn me round, ain't gonna let no posse men turn me round and gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. And she said, at that moment, up till then, they thought they had beat us by a good whipping. And at that moment, we realized we had not lost, we had won. And then two weeks later, we got the permission and marched to Montgomery and the St. Jude's. Harry Belafonte got all the people in, you know, Nina Simone, Odetta, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Pete Seeger, and, and uh, just uh, quite, a, quite a gathering. Then we march up to the, to the State House. And uh, uh, we thought, well, Five months later, they finally passed the Voting Rights Act, but I was in jail in a different county, so I didn't know about it. But that's kind of what was going on. And, but then Vietnam War and the uh, 
uh, and the Watch Rebellion and the militancy at, and forgetting about nonviolence and the, the mission that Martin Luther King was. And John Lewis was real close with Martin, but he was, uh, uh, he was national chairman of SNCC and SNCC was getting hardcore radical and I kind of agreed with both of them. You know, I was working with both groups but that got difficult being a Southern white boy because sometimes whatever group I was with would think I was a sky. I mean, if I'm working with SNCC out in the countryside, they think, well, I'm a spy for SCLC. And if I'm working with SCLC because SNCC wasn't doing anything where I was in the town, they thought I was a spy for SNCC. So it got very, very difficult. And then the uh, and then the anti-white in SNCC took place. John Lewis, uh, this, this book, Raymond Arsenal has got a new book about John Lewis, and it's really good, uh, The Search for the Beloved Community. And um, uh, we didn't know each other very well, so he didn't know how much I agreed with him, but uh, Stokely, we needed more militancy and stronger leadership, but we didn't want to throw out the whole thing, nonviolence and building the beloved community and all that kind of stuff. So both extremes got severe and John Lewis was right in the middle. Well, he was on top and I was at the bottom and I was also right in the middle. Because I, I, I agreed we needed stronger leadership and be more militant, but that didn't mean throwing out our whole philosophy of who we were. But then everything started falling apart, the Vietnam War being drafted, um, and some people like Cleve Sellers and I both refused to, the draft. He's the one they tried to kill in the Orangeburg Massacre in uh, February 8th, 1968, the uh, South Carolina uh, uh, State Police just started shooting and they killed three and wounded 28 because there had been a protest at a bowling alley to try to enter, integrate a bowling alley. And they shot Cleve, but the first guy they killed looked a lot like Cleve, so they're probably targeting him. And he, later on, his son, was the youngest state legislator in South Carolina history. Um, Cleve, I think, died a, 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 a few years ago. He was, he was a good friend of mine. And even though he was uh, in the leadership, we got along real well. And um, so everything starts getting out of hand. You got the Vietnam War and everybody going north. And uh, let me, uh, give you a little, um, uh, a little poem here. Um, it's been a long road to home now from Ducktown, I was born in Ducktown, Tennessee. It's been a long road to home now from Ducktown to Longmont, and I pray there's still more yet to come. I've been pushing this plow over hard stony ground, trying to plant y'all some trees and some flowers. And I've seen many cold dawns and strode mostly alone while I worshiped the sun and the snow. And I've carried the memory of what all I've encountered, and I'm trying to make sense of it all. Someone gave me a mission I've been trying to be true to as I plowed every step of the way, yet my guides have been got scattered, wearing many disguises while I listened to what they might say. Some spoke backwards, some frontwards, some screamed and then cursed, first at me, then at those whom I love. But I've carried the memory of what all I've encountered as an off cryptic sign from above. Now confusions have plagued me, many dangers waylaid me as I ran up this crooked old trail. I keep getting back up from the swamp and the muck, praying someone might stand for my bail. But the night has been long, crafted, uh, uh, stifled many a song that my heart is still longing to hear. And I try even now, though I still ain't learned how to dispel that old demon, I fear. 
but it keeps right on working, crushing all my working for love, beauty, justice, and truth. And I run up the mountains, shout my, so my path kept on winding to escape the confining prison walls which have stolen my youth. And I run up the mountains, shout my name to the stars, then return to my hovel alone, knowing nothing is promised but to do what I came for and to stand up and sing you my song. Thank you. I would love to have uh, questions, discussion, comments, and hopefully about that period in history. Maybe I'll get a chance to speak sometime again and we can talk more about contemporary. We all know what's happening currently, but uh, mostly about dealing with that period of time. I got here late, but... Oh, yeah. I got here late, so maybe you answered this question, but did you ever meet any of the Freedom Riders? Uh, I knew a number of them. Well, I knew John Lewis, I knew Bernard Lafayette. Uh, C.T. C. T. Vivian was, uh, you know, my closest friend among the top leadership, and I met I met Jim Farmer, and I met Dick Gregory when he was a big man in Amelia Boynton's living room the first day I was in Selma. And um, uh, let me give you one uh, uh, related. I forgot to mention this. The last time I saw Martin, um, I had been working with the Scope Project. Uh, they were training in Atlanta, but they were not doing good training and history was being denied and and there was some corruption going on so i got sent during the train, uh, training i got sent to lead a recruiting mission up east and the two guys they sent with me were just there to spy on me they didn't do any work and we get up i, I spoke at Bryn Mawr, i spoke at haverford in philly and we go up to princeton and they flew up another driver and left me stranded in Princeton with no contacts and 15 cents in my pocket. So I made it up to New York and then the subway was 15 cents so you could go somewhere. So it took me about a month to make it back uh, to the black family I stayed with in Philly and they became real close with me. And I st uh, off and on for several years, I, I would stay there. And um, I get down to Washington and Walter Fauntroy was on the board of directors of SCLC. He became the congressman from Washington for many years. And uh, he called up Martin and Martin uh, called me to the phone and he told me to meet him at the airport the next day at noon. So I go out to the airport and he uh, breaks away from his entourage. He, sees me over there, he comes home and he clasps my hand in his and gives me $25 and a plane ticket to Atlanta. And he said, give him hell, Arkansas. So uh, that's been my life ever since that moment. And the book uh, that's written about my work in Marengo County, Alabama, uh, that uh, if white kids die, it's out of print now because it was the first book published about of summer of 65 and so it went out of print before the others got written but anyway uh that's you know that's been my message and i've been uh, i've been trying to carry out martin luther king personally sent me back to alabama and, and so here i am thank you I mean, we, we got another half hour, so any questions or comments, I appreciate it. Yes. You mentioned the draft, you said you refused to go. How did you work through that? Uh, that got difficult because I had just, um, I turned 21 the night they killed Jonathan Daniels. And um, so I was working with Snick at that point in, in, uh, in uh, no, in Dallas County around. And um, I was in the SNCC office one day, because in Lowndes County, there weren't any whites in the uh, 
you know, Lowndes County Freedom Organization, where most of the shooting was going on. And um, FBI came in and uh, drug me down the stairs and sent me off, uh, you know, and I was in Jim Clark's jail for two weeks, but I would sing all night. So partly to keep people know that I'm still alive. Um, and uh, then after two weeks, I was causing too much trouble. So then they called federal marshals and took me 200 miles down to Mobile. And they kicked me into this cell with 22 white guys and they said, well, I can't quote because they don't want the real language uh, spoken, but they kicked me in there. And uh, um, I was uh, uh, in there for 11 days in the cell and they never told me what I was charged with. And um, there was, uh, uh, I, I got three or four guys near me to kind of whistle or tap my foot or if one of the thugs was coming by. And um, I, I learned that uh, the main gangster had been offered an extra carton of cigarettes a week and 10 years off his sentence if he would have me killed in that cell. And so his boyfriend in the cell um, uh, tried to commit suicide and I got to him and got a tourniquet on his arm. So four hours later, they come in and they chain me up and they strip me naked and throw me into a hole. I was in there for 11 days. And then I got a phone call smuggled out to Stokely Carmichael, which was a miracle because it was a French prisoner who was getting out didn't speak much English, but he calls the Freedom House in Selma. Stokely happened to be there at that moment. It was one of those miracles. He called Bayard Rustin in New York, who was the head of the War of Resistors League, who organized the March on Washington. And he calls the Mennonites, and they call the government and say they know I'm in there so they can kill me. So then, after 11 days, they throw me a pair of shorts and chain me up, and I go into federal court, Judge Daniel Thomas, appointed by Kennedy. Uh, he said, boy, do you accept a real or, or, or waive a preliminary hearing on your case? I said, what does that mean? He said, shut up and answer the question. And I said, uh, four or five questions. May I speak with an attorney? Shut up and answer the question. May I make a phone call? I've been in jail for several weeks in different counties. I've never been allowed to make a phone call. He said, boy, you shut up and an answer the question. I will hold you in contempt of the United States District Court. Do you understand, boy? So I flipped a coin in my head and I got lucky. I chose to waive it and that meant I got driven back to Arkansas where the charges had started. And um, and so then I was able to speak with the U.S. attorney and eventually negotiate my way out. And then my father died and I was, my own church, I didn't know we had three KKK members on the board of deacons in my church. And they came and physically threw my brother aside and said, you will not attend your father's funeral. If you show up, we'll have you thrown in jail again. But anyway, it's, it's long stories, but that was the beginning, the next phase of my life. How old were you then? Huh? I just turned 21 that month. Yeah. Yes? Now, were you in Chicago when uh, Fred Hampton was leading the Black Panthers? I was, and I only saw him once. Uh, there were. Uh, because um, I didn't know just a little bit about him. And there was a group called the OL, the Oct October League, uh, one of the radical uh, groups who was more uh, connected with, with their group. I was um, briefly with the group called PL, Progressive Labor Party. I never was a member because they didn't want my kind of thinking to ever get up to a level to where they make decisions, I was always on the subgroup. 
Uh, everything I've ever done, it's always been like that. But anyway, yeah, he was, he was incredible, but it was uh, Fred Hampton, um, um, not Fred. Uh, well, anyway, the Attorney General of Illinois, who was the one that worked with the FBI and the Chicago police to have that massacre, and uh, a friend of mine got uh, 30 years in jail for uh, being a, uh, on the edge of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, Hampton was was serious. We, we had Black Panthers in Chicago, but the West Side Panthers kind of recruited street gang. South Side Panthers was more working class, and the head of security, Lacey Bonner, was a good friend of mine. And um, so I, I worked with South Side Panthers, but I, I never knew the West Side Panthers very good at all. So yeah, good question. Yes. Hi, Strider. Hiya. Good uh, to see you, Joe. Good to see you. So Strider, I was watching TV last night, and it was a newscast on MSNBC, and the host introduced the show by saying today is June 19th, and explain that June 19th celebrates the final announcement, so to speak, of the freedom of freeing slaves. Yeah. And it occurred when General Gordon arrived at Galveston and the word hadn't gotten there until 1866 that the emancipation had occurred. And I have just been thinking all day long that this story that I have heard all my life can't be true. It's absolutely not true in my mind that it took that long for the story to reach Galveston. So I did a little bit of research, but do you happen to know the backstory of what happened in Galveston? Uh, I know that he was the head of a major army contention that was going to bring the word to Texas and then spread out from there. But it took several months to get more broadly around. But in the civil rights movement in Alabama, we never heard of Juneteenth. Nobody knew about it because what happened was a lot of the plantation owners marched their slaves a thousand miles from Alabama or Mississippi or Louisiana across into Texas. And you know, the, the, the songs about, you know, the Alamo and for Texas and freedom, no, it was for Texas and slavery. That was the entire point of the war in 1846, was Mexico had abolished slavery. So we got to make Texas a slave state, so we got to have a war against Mexico. And so that was where that all come. Everything in history is complex. That's why they're abolishing history. You know, uh, so if you don't know anything, then like you got to be carefully taught. You get pointed out there and sent that way. And uh, so thank you. Yeah, I did. I never heard of it until recent years, Juneteenth. And, and it makes sense, but it's a little bit overdone because, like you said, uh, there are different levels of what's going on. And you know, like Chivington, um, Chivington, uh, they have a street in Longmont named Chivington Drive. And we had a major thing for several years. And finally, we made the city council agree they would put up a plaque explaining Chivington. And then they decided, no, no, we don't want anybody to know that. We'll just get rid of the street. But Ernie Greenlee, um, who uh, would, we played chess 200 times, uh, he was, his grandfather, was on the Chevington group at Sand Creek. They came up and he and said, you, uh, you know, come join us. He said, no, I'm farming, I'm busy. And they put a gun to his head and they said, you're coming. That's how they recruited the people to from Denver or all around the area to go do the Sand Creek massacre. So everything has corollaries and everything has connections like I didn't know what history was until I heard Fannie Lou Hamer talk. And boom, wow, that's history. So I've been studying history ever since. That's why I've never been allowed to have a job, like teaching or anything like that. But anyway, yeah. 
More some? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned the incident with your mother at the water fountain. Um, other than that, how did the rest of your family react to your activism? Uh, in the beginning, my dad was a conservative Yankee Norwegian. My mother was a Southern Belle, second generation deposed aristocracy. Her <coughs> aunt, I think, was the president of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in Birmingham. So when I got uh, beat up and almost killed in Camden, that was on television. And my aunt happened to be at her aunt's house that day and saw it. So they sent a Bible down to the jail in Ken. I never got it, but they, uh, uh, so that was, that was their attitude. But I, I had a cousin, uh, Jane Jr., who was uh, very, she, she rode horses and had her own independent life from the structure of the family. I had one aunt who was really a good person. So she never was into the racism thing. And my mother, my mother wasn't, my mother, even though a, a, a colleague of hers told me 40 years later that my mother was Scarlett O'Hara. She didn't say she was like her, she said she was her. So how do I process this? 20 years after my mother has died, all of a sudden I'm, I'm the child of Scarlett O'Hara. How do I deal with this? But anyway, she, uh, she was always real sociable and friendly. She was the only person in town that would go to black people's graduations or weddings or funerals. And, uh, and um, my dad never knew a black person, didn't have any structural hatred, but never respected them as having any, you know, any back and forth. And so he was neither, they never used the N word in the house and never had, uh, tolerated it, but they were not, they were not freedom riders, <laughs> let's put it that way. A uh, conservative Yankee and a, and a liberal Southerner. So, yes. Oh, it was, it's just an interesting story. I was just moving my hair, but thank oh, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more or comments. You, it doesn't have to be a question. Anything, Noah? Uh, I think you're a larger than life person. I really enjoy hearing you speak. You're here. Thank you. Thank you. Times have been rough, including recently. Some of you know I got run over by a truck two days after Thanksgiving. He destroyed my e bike, but. Uh, so I got a backup mountain bike that a friend gave me that doesn't quite work, but I've gone 1,500 miles since Christmas on it, but I can't go up into the mountains because the gear strip out. But anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, he destroyed my bike, but he missed my feet and my head, you know, because it, it was a big truck. Fortunately, it was a big truck. Because if it was a smaller truck, the undercarriage would have destroyed me. Did the insurance pay for anything? No, nothing. He didn't see Well, it. this is America. I mean, Trump's America. Everybody's hit and run now. You know. Yeah. How did you land up in Longmont? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, I had to move. Um, 20 times in 15 years trying to find a safe place to live. Um, one of my landlords carried a gun and tried to kill my dog and I guess uh, trying to get my education and trying to work at the same time, whatever I could find. And eventually it was, uh, anybody here from the LCJD, Longmont Citizens for Justice and Democracy uh, started Jim Kenworthy uh, got it started in about um, 2001, and I was trying to find a place to live, and I came to their demonstration a couple of times, and I found a place in Longmont, so that's, that's how I got 
you know, stabilized. And uh, I started my graduate career at Cambridge University. And I wrote a paper on the history of the English Civil War. And my professor, John Morrill, who was the world's leading authority on that field, said my paper is the best he ever had in his career. So that was rather nice, but I was never allowed to have a real job here. So I've just done pickup work. But um, you can talk to Don Head Head about that. He'll, he'll have reasons. I mean, it, everything is top down. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Strider. Uh, my name is James, and uh, I can't imagine that all of us hearing, all, I can't imagine all of us hearing this kind of doesn't bring up some of our, our own stories. I'm curious, you know, what are some of the stories uh, that brings up for you guys? So I'd like to offer any other sharings that you guys might have. I like that. Uh, anybody want to offer something? Well, I'll say I didn't become a freedom writer, but it, as a young child, I went on a family vacation to Florida. I, had, I lived in Maryland, and um, with cousins went to this chicken place that was owned by Les Dramatics, and Les Dramatics was there, and so... Oh, Les Dramatics. Les Dramatics. Oh was my there. gosh. That was the the axe handled matter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was the first place I ever saw segregated water fountains, and I, I still remember being horrified um, that that was, that was happening. Yeah, well, when I first went up to Yankee Land, I thought it was a different country. And I got up to New York, I'd been there a day or two, and I tried to go to the library. And the library closed at five o'clock. It's like, what are people who work in the daytime, where are they gonna learn anything? You know, it's like, I thought it was a different country. I thought it, they really had things like libraries, you know. And so I, I see your point. I mean, boom, it's, it's really extreme. And in many cases, after the Civil War, conditions for black people in the South were much worse than they had been before the Civil War. Because then plantation owners had no incentive to keep them alive, you know, to feed them enough to live on. So they made the wages so low. And the part of the game is the whole economic game. If you got a whole uh, oppressed workforce that must work for below minimum wage, then you can make white workers um, you know, you give them a nickel more, and I'll, I'll give you an example. In Marengo County, the the uh, the head of the uh, the movement in Demopolis, Henry Haskins Jr. I got along well with his father, but we sort of got along moderately. And he was telling this story, and I don't know if I can say it without his language, but. Um, black man, a minister of the uh, of Mount Zion Church there. And he said, you know, I'm out working one day in this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, working, uh, no, no, two ditch diggers are, um, you know, working and the, uh, uh, and they're not getting enough done, so he needs to hire some more to get the job done that day. Here come these two black guys, and they, um, uh, and he says, uh, yeah, I'll put you, uh, put you on. And so, and, uh, and they said, what, uh, the white guys uh, who were working, they said, uh, what you, uh, what you gonna pay them? Well, I'll, I'll pay them 50 cents an hour, just like you're getting. And said, what? And they throw down their shovels and they're going to stomp off the job. You're not going to let a black person, you know, get the same wage as me. And he said, oh, so finally he says, oh, he says, all right, I'll pay them 20, 25 cents an hour and you'll get 30. Okay, they're all happy and they pick their shovels back up. So they're happy to work for 20 cents an hour less 
just as long as it's more than the black guys can get. But uh, that, that's, that's, that's the entire point of segregation and Jim Crow was to have multiple tier wage systems so that whoever owns everything can, can have a higher profit level. Yes? Yeah, I got a short story about segregation. I spent the first five years of my life in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and sometimes in the summer we'd go to a swimming pool we get there about three. We get there about noon time and leave about three. And uh, one time we were late, and we were still there at five o'clock. And the lifeguards came out and said, "Get out! You got to get out! You can't stay here now." So we got out and couldn't figure out what happened. All of a sudden, the doors burst open, and about two hundred black kids came running out, screaming, leaping, jumped into the pool. They were having so much fun. You couldn't believe it. And I looked at my brother and said, how come they're having so much more fun than we ever did in the pool? <laughs> yeah. But that was a, my first experience with segregation. Well, we, and I didn't realize it until much later. Yeah, we had that in my hometown, Melbourne, Arkansas. Uh, there was a black pool day uh, on Tuesdays. Uh, uh, whites got, you know, got, uh, uh, Thursday through Monday, but blacks got Tuesday. So what they would do, they would, um, uh, that was standard procedure all over the, not everywhere, but pretty regular. And then when the Supreme Court decision comes in, uh, separate but equal is not equal. And uh, then what they did, then they closed the pool for everybody. So we never had a swimming pool in Melbourne after the, uh, the you know, Supreme Court thing. So uh, what they would do is Black Scott Tuesday, and then they would close the pool and clean the pool on Wednesday. So whites could have a fresh clean pool every week. So I never learned how to swim very good because the rivers tended to be too low and uh, didn't have good training and not much access to the local swimming. I mean, they closed it by the time I got old enough to use it much. So, uh, yes? What is, uh, which one of you is that one, two, three, four, five people? So you're on the far left on that picture or in the middle? I'm wearing the town. Oh, okay. That's Jimmy Collier. Her name is Doris. Her name is Alberta. That's Chuck Fager, who uh, we never got along. He, he just happened to be in the picture. Um, and um, uh, and I, I, I think I know the other two people, but I can't remember. But that was uh, the third, third night of the march, and Toshi Seeger took that picture. Oh, more something like five minutes officially. <laughs> I don't mind staying longer, but uh, everybody else has schedules. <clears throat> Bob, anything from you? Yeah, have you read the uh, book, The Civil War, by other means? Um, say that again. Have you read the book, Civil War, by other means? No, I haven't. To describe just what you did, how the black people were treated, they were hung if they tried to vote. Oh, yeah. And uh, President Grant tried to do something about it, being what was then a Republican Party. Yeah. And the Democrats in the South didn't do about that. So the North was real good about it for two or three years, and they, they got bored with it. So. Well, you know, the chairman of the Republican Party during one election season was uh, John Lynch, black man from Mississippi who had three terms in Congress. And he wrote a number of books. I've got some of his books if you, uh, but it was, uh, um, he was very instrumental in whatever year that was, 1892 or 96, I think it was, but uh, John Roy Lynch, uh, very worth worth reading anything you wrote or about him. And there was a, 
uh, a Yankee steel man who was kind of a historian, and Henry Ford Rhodes, who uh, uh, Lex challenged him about some of his uh, severe stuff, and he said, and, and he said to his uh, confidant, "Do not arrange any meeting with." Uh, you know, with that man, we have nothing to discuss because I am an honest historian and he's prejudiced by the fact that he's black and that kind of stuff. But all American history was written by Southern Confederate generals. Basically, they created the whole structure. So from 1890 till 1951, all American history was written from the Southern standpoint until C. Van Woodward wrote Origins of the New South. And I called him when I wrote my paper on it and he said, uh, uh, I had no respect for the uh, you know, uh, uh, history, Southern history profession and they regarded me the same way. And uh, it, uh, yeah. I Thanks. saw that the, uh, there's a new movie out uh, called The Civil War. I don't know much more about it, but it's, it's sort of like there, there's uh, a lot of violence and there, um, uh, that, that was kind of a dis discussion. Anyway, I, I don't know if you've heard about that, but there's a, you know, a big new production of The Civil War. There is a book recently out called The Silent Cavalry, and it's about a uh, a couple of counties in northern Alabama that joined the Union uh, and fought with uh, with Grant and Sherman, uh, and it's called the Silent Cavalry. I haven't read it yet, but I bought one. If anybody wants to buy it, that's that's what I do. But uh, uh, and you know the Davis Davis County down in southern uh, southeastern Mississippi. They, uh, they seceded from the South and they had their own structure for about 20 years. An integrated, uh, you know, region in, in Eastern Mississippi. I, I never heard of that until the movie came out. So, yes. You mentioned a woman called Fanny Lou. Fanny Lou Hamer. That really will go to history. What was it she had shared with you with that? She um, she she had a fourth grade education and she spoke in front of Congress in big time. But she could pick four hundred pounds of cotton a day and regular, but she was timekeeper on the plantation where she lived for eighteen years and she went down to register to vote one time in uh, 1962, and she, while she's uh, off, the plantation owner comes by and uh, calls her, her husband, Pap, said, Pap, you tell your Fanny, Fanny uh, to get her name off of that list. And Pap said, you know, I can't tell Fanny anything. She does what, <laughs> what so she gets back home. She is evicted that same day. After 18 years on this plantation, she gets thrown out on the, hey girl, she gets thrown out of her home for having registered to vote. And that was, it was, I mean, in Lowndes County and Wilcox County, Alabama, no black person had ever been allowed to register for 75 years. Each one of them had more than 80% black population. Camden, Alabama and Wilcox County is where they tried to beat me to death. What was my charge? Uh, they hit us with the tear gas and everybody starts running away and coughing and vomiting and stuff. And I start singing, ain't gonna let no tear gas. Turn me around and gonna keep on a walking. Keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. And everybody comes running back. So that's when the police concentrated it and every one of them were beating on me on the head. And they would have killed me except Huntley Brinkley was there that day, so it made national news. Could you repeat her name, please? Fannie Lou Hamer. 
And she died in poverty also, but she spent her whole life putting it together. And um, uh, I, I got to mention Ella Baker, and we're about to go. Um, Ella Baker, I, I would put three women, the greatest women in American history, Harriet Tubman, who would be on your $20 bill except Trump became president and canceled it. Ida B. Wells, who started the crusade against lynching back in 1890, 1892. And she grew, was born in slavery, was teaching school in Memphis when she was 16 years old. Her parents and siblings died of yellow fever. And they burned down her building and tried to destroy her because she was uh, leading the anti-slavery <coughs> crusade. She finished her life in Chicago and was very prominent there. And um, and Miss Ella Baker, um, who was created SCLC and SNCC. She got SCLC started for Martin Luther King. They couldn't find a man who was competent enough to run it. So they made her acting executive director for four or five years. And then when the sitting started in 1960, she called the conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, where, where we, we had our 50 and many anniversaries. And um, she went by herself as a single black woman on buses throughout the South and organized 200 local chapters of the NAACP in 1941 and 42 by herself. And then 20 years later, when the movement came, it was the people that she had found and recruited and trained 20 years earlier that started the movement in Mississippi. That's how Bob Moses found Herbert Lee in Macomb, Mississippi. And I would put a close fourth would be Eleanor Roosevelt, because she did a lot too. Yeah, I know we have to close up here, Bryson, but like, can we stick around and have smaller, you know, discussion, further discussion, uh, you know, a little later after we close down, if people who want to leave. I, I'm, I'm fine with that, anybody that wants to, I mean, they don't close until 4.30 or 5, <laughs> if anybody wants to have a little gathering, I'm, 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 I'm up with that. Uh, let me give you a little uh, uh, closer poem. Um, when I, I see what decade or century I wrote this one in. 1985, uh, just one. If I can help one person to heal his wounds, if I can bring courage to one who is paralyzed by fear, understanding to one drowning in confusion, a home for one who is lost in the wilderness. If I can clear somebody's eyes so she may see the rainbow and bring the word of truth to one beset by lies. If I can sing to you a song to help the flame grow and let you know that love is still the prize. If I can help you find a meaning when you flounder in despair, to chase away the lonely from your heart and spring you from the prison built by those who do not care, who practice murder and oppression as their art. If I can free the little child within you and teach you once again to sing and dance, if I know some of the steps, let me begin to sit on the path this very day and no longer waste my chance.